नमस्कार फैजल वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन एंड एज विद एवरी वन एल्स लेट स्टार्ट बाय हियरिंग योर अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी ऑफ इधर द एक्सपीरियंस और द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ अहिंसा well um when i was growing up in dar es salaam in tanzania uh my father had a portrait a famous portrait of gandhi seated at a spinning wheel in his place of work in his office and that was my first exposure to gandhi ji and at the time of course i thought of him only as an indian uh identified icon so you know because we were indians uh living in east africa uh he represented us in some way he represented what was the best in us uh and i didn't think about non violence as such so much he was simply a kind of figure of identification in a way someone we could be proud of uh and only later did it did it occur to me that unlike most people's heroes this hero was one uh whose fame did not reside in conquest uh did not this reside in dom- domination uh but if conquest was involved at all it was the conquest of violence uh which of course is the title of a famous book written i think in the 1960s by john bondurant in the us one of the earliest american studies of gandhi at a time when the civil rights movement was important in the united states at whose heart lay gandhi's ideas uh, and when uh, we moved to canada we immigrated to canada along with many other indians initially from uganda when the indians were expelled there in night from there in 1972 and then later on from tanzania and kenya when indians started leaving uh and the ugandans had already made a place in both britain and in canada so we had some place to go to uh so when the attenborough film gandhi was shown uh and of course it won the best picture award the oscar for best picture in in, in the us um my mother and i went to see the film in vancouver where we then lived and it was extraordinary because there was a long lineup outside the theater that snaked around the block uh just to get into it because of course it was a huge hit and that was the first time it occurred to me that an indian someone like gandhi could have this kind of pull uh until then being an indian was always something i had to explain as an immigrant you know like people had all kinds of misconceptions or they knew something but not very much uh so it was always being asian or indian was always being something highly particular that had to be explained or explained away and suddenly for the first time it was commanding in that non-violent way the attention of thousands of people uh, we no longer had to like explain things <laughs> suddenly uh people seem to have been attracted by it uh, and that struck me as well and then of course when i went to university and um uh especially graduate studies at the university of chicago then i read gandhi seriously for the first time as a student yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh before then i had only really encountered his ideas from people's conversations but also from the amar chitra katha version of gandhi i had read the autobiography autobiography as a high school student i think uh and it made some effect on me but i didn't really know how to think about it uh but when in graduate school i started reading other works starting with hind swaraj and then moving on uh suddenly it was like an act of recognition i i thought i understood my own early experiences of him from his image in my father's office uh and this gandhi grew and grew from being the representative of an indian minority in east africa uh to uh one uh in canada the same minority in canada he suddenly became or he gradually became a kind of world historical figure uh and ironically not one who uh 
was there simply for us to feel proud of any longer. Mm. Uh, you know, that is a false way of looking at Gandhi, but unfortunately an all too common way of looking at him, mm. uh, especially in India. Um, but rather as a thinker of our common world uh, mm. and not just an ethnic or a national identity figure or icon. Um, yeah. And so in a way, the closer I've moved to Gandhi's ideas, uh, the less important he has become to me as an Indian. Uh, he is, of course, he was an Indian, but uh, you know, I see Gandhi in the same way or on the same, as it were, level as I would put any great thinker of the world uh, or great political figure. Uh, Faisal, I find it fascinating that as a historian, your book on Gandhi is called The Temptation of Violence. And your book on contemporary terrorism is called um, uh, The Search for uh, In Search of Humanity. How do you see now in our times the dynamic between violence and nonviolence? If we can maybe just cover an overview of that and then come back to some of the more historical uh, issues with Gandhi and violence and nonviolence. Well, it's interesting you should mention, you know, the uh, w one of the two books are written on terrorism because, uh, you know, I had written about Gandhi, not a book yet, but I'd written at least one or two articles about Gandhi before I am, after 9-11, I embarked upon the study of, uh, of terrorism. Uh, and so in a way it was, Gandhi, who allowed me to think about terrorism in a different way, for at least a couple of reasons. One, of course, is that uh, Gandhi himself had he himself had been called a terrorist uh, by the British on occasion, but uh, he also confronted terrorism in his own lifetime, uh, because uh, in the early nationalist movement there was a violent uh, uh, segment as well which specialized in assassinations uh, and bombings. Hind Swaraj so Gandhi, has written in response to some of them. Exactly. So Gandhi had dealt with the problem of terrorism, which is not the same kind of terrorism that we've seen subsequently and certainly not after 9-11, but he dealt in particular with the subject of sacrificial terror, of people willing to die for their ideas. And so it was his understanding of this particular kind of evil, uh, as he would name it, that in part informed my own study of terrorism. So I approached the study of violence uh, coming from the study of nonviolence, uh, because nonviolence, among other things, involves, in my view, one of the deepest analyses of violence of its opposite. Um, and it cannot simply be sequestered from it. Uh, so my book on Gandhi was precisely about how those two realms are intertwined. Yes. Um, that violence and nonviolence are intertwined. Gandhi fully realized this. Um, and for him, uh, the sacrificial mode of violence was interesting because uh, it signaled that even at the heart of violence lay something other than itself. Uh, that the violence of this form of sacrifice was so excessive precisely because it had to bridge the gap between virtue as a form of sacrifice and it's as it were hijacking or occupation by violence. Uh, so when Gandhi, for instance, reads the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharat more largely, he says he, his understanding of the uh, uh, of the battle of the Mahabharat uh, is that the evil army of Duryodhana uh, is evil precisely because at some level it depends upon goodness. There's a paradoxical relationship there. What does this mean? This is what he says. That any army, whether the Ordhanas or, or, 
Arjunas for that matter, uh, can only hold together because of virtues like friendship and sacrifice and bravery and compassion that soldiers feel for one feeling. another. Exactly. Um, and these are indubitably virtues. Yeah. You know? uh, and what this means is that evil, even if it is utterly self-interested, must rely upon goodness. Uh, otherwise, it cannot itself hold its troops together. Uh, and this is what makes it what it is, uh, that its violence comes out of its very superficiality. Uh, the fact that it cannot control even its own base, try as it might. So virtue can be directed towards evil, uh, these virtues of sacrifice and courage and all the rest. Uh, but it can never be extinguished. So uh, goodness undergirds violence as well as nonviolence. And it is this commonality, the kind of perversion of goodness or virtue uh, in one army, let's say, of the Mahabharat and its uh, purity or, or, or recognition as virtue in the other army of the Pandavas on the other. The fact that they share this virtue is what allows for violence to be converted into its opposite, into nonviolence. Otherwise, there would be nothing there. So in a way, it's a really optimistic vision of the world, but optimistic not because it disregards evil or it downplays it, but because it sees even in evil an opportunity for nonviolence. Uh, and nonviolence is a negative virtue. It's called ahimsa, as you said, nonviolence. Um, precisely because of this recognition of the commonality, uh, you know, that binds together violence and nonviolence, uh, virtue and vice. Uh, and so what nonviolence does, its negative uh, character is to withdraw virtue from the grasp of violence. Uh, and if you do that, then violence will collapse, evil will collapse, because it can only hold together due to goodness. Right? And so Gandhi's first great national movement, of course, is non-cooperation, another negative term like ahimsa. He loves negative, negative terms, you know, aparigraha, non-possession, etc. Right? So uh, uh, the negative form uh, is important because it signals the withdrawal of virtue from evil, of nonviolence from violence. And once that withdrawal is affected, then Gandhi thought violence and with it evil will collapse of its own accord. So this is a very, um, it's typical of Gandhi. It's both a complex way of thinking, but it's, it's at the same time quite simple. Yes. Uh, that is to yes. say, it's not difficult to grasp, but it's, implications are very complex. Um, and, and so the whole point is how do you, how do you A, analyze what evil is by seeing how it's made, to, made up of itself and its opposite? Yeah. And secondly, how do you therefore um, make possible the withdrawal of virtue mm. from evil, mm. uh, collaboration with evil? So and that's what brings the two together. Yeah, in 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 light of what you've just said, uh, then how do we look at the contemporary phenomenon of terrorism, which actually nobody is trying to fight through nonviolence, right? Hmm. Uh, I mean, the, uh, all states are uh, committed to the war on terror, and. Uh, in what ways, because I know you have looked at this, you've looked at the insides of that world to some extent. Uh, can you throw some light on if at all there are any possibilities of nonviolence in this sense, in what we are living through now? Gandhi himself spoke about this when in Him Swaraj, uh, among other places, when discussing the assassination of Sir Curzon Wiley by Madan Lal Dingra, who then sacrificed his life, right? He, he allowed himself to be arrested. He knew he would be executed. And Gandhi says he gave his life in the wrong way, that the act was noble. The act of sacrifice, sacrificing himself was noble, uh, 
he gave his life in the wrong way. Gandhi was not against people giving their lives, but to do so while killing someone, uh, an act of gross violence, of course, he was against. Uh, so even in the act of terror, he saw that moment of virtue. And I think what he understood by it is that here we have an indubitable virtue being perverted into its opposite. The way to deal with it is to, as it were, rescue it. So mm. it's not to say sacrifice is a terrible thing mm. uh, and you must all operate according to the logic of self-interest. Uh, you know, uh, and self-interest urges you not to kill yourself or not to, you know. But in fact, self-interest does not urge you not to kill other people. Mm. Uh, if, it, uh, uh, if it is in your interest to do so and you don't get caught. Yeah. So self-interest only has a certain degree of moral relevance and virtue built into it. So in a way, I think what uh, Gandhi might have said if faced with this kind of sacrificial terrorism is that we have in a way allowed for the perversion of a virtue, which is sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And we have allowed for its perversion because we have ourselves extirpated such a virtue from our own societies and our own lives. Yeah. Whereas for Gandhi, Indian social relations, and he thought social relations in many other parts of the world, continued to be defined by forms of sacrifice rather than forms of self-interest. Whether it was the everyday sacrifice of a mother mm. who decides to cook food that her child might like, but she doesn't herself fancy, to the sacrifices that lovers make for each other or uh, parents and children make for one another or uh, yeah. intimates or whatever, right? So there, there's a whole range of sacrifices, including at the very end, the sacrifice of your life for yeah. someone. And Gandhi thought that our social lives are informed by such sacrifices. They are not actually defined by self-interest. Mm. They cannot be. Yeah. Uh, because if they were, then no society could hold together. And that is why he understood so all societies as being fundamentally held together by duty and sacrifice. Mm. Not uh, rights. Not rights, right? So um, uh, he always focused on duties rather than rights. Not that he was against rights, mm -hmm. but rights, of course, were legal instruments that were given and enforced by the state. Uh, therefore, they can be taken away from you. And they are your claims to various kinds of property, uh, whether it is landed property or intellectual property or your identity as a property uh, or uh, your, your behavior and act seen as being your property and therefore legitimate. Um, it is a fundamentally capitalist category. Uh, for Gandhi, because it's linked to ownership. Whereas duties are yours. No one can take your duty away from you. And just as the chief right is the right to life, the chief duty is always the duty to die for someone, something, some cause. So Gandhi wanted to rescue this idea of selflessness and altruism and sacrifice, which has many words, including words like balidan or tiag, uh, in Indian languages. Yeah. And each of these words means something slightly differently, something slightly different. Balidan is like the offering of one's life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And tyag is a renunciation. Uh, yeah. And of yeah. course, there are others. Kurbani is another one uh, from another tradition. So uh, he urged us to focus on this particular virtue, which if we seek to remove it from our lives mm. really allows it to be taken over and perverted and made evil as in the case of self-sacrificing terrorism. Uh, so again, I think for Gandhi, the task would be how do you actually withdraw sacrifice from violence and from evil uh, and make it your own. Uh, whereas counterterrorism has operated in exactly the opposite way. Uh, it has operated and it has been very difficult for it to operate because how do you deal with someone who's willing to die? Uh, you know, uh, so it, had, it has had to try to rebuild an ideal of self-interest yeah. and being invested in and attached to the world. Mm 
uh, in order to, um, as it were, reform or, uh, um, you know, rework the mentalities of terrorists uh, or people who might be sympathetic to them. Whereas for Gandhi, this is actually going in the wrong direction. Uh, the point is to do the opposite uh, because our societies and our human relations are inevitably based on duty, altruism and sacrifice. Uh, and you cannot get rid of them. And the problem is that when you try to get rid of them, what you get is their perversion. Mm. But it's so difficult in everyday life no, to see this, dif this distinction uh, because a lot of today what we see being expressed as hatred, as bigotry, uh, if, you, if you talk to such people, they think that they are actually being uh, very dutiful that they are carrying out the duty of protecting whichever group or whichever um, community they have a sense of identity with. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. So how do you see this? Uh, or let me put it another way. What are the possibilities of nonviolence in a world where A, identities have become more and more narrow, more and more fragile, and uh, precariously um, held. Uh, so in, at the moment, is there any effort that you know of which is trying to address? Uh, let's just talk about terrorism here because the other sphere of polarization is too wide. But do you know of any efforts where the terrorist sense of duty uh, in the way, in what Gandhi would call a perversion of duty, is being addressed in some approximate of a nonviolent approach. I don't know if anything specifically, um, though here and there you do see, uh, even within terrorism of the Al Qaeda sort, for instance, the terrorists themselves, when they recruited younger people, uh, and we know this from Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri, etc. They had to prevent their recruits from going and blowing themselves up um, immediately. Uh, because they had to make sure that that kind of sacrifice took as many other lives as possible. Whereas some of these individuals were not actually interested, apparently, in taking the lives of others so much, so interested in sacrificing their own lives itself a perversion of sacrifice, uh, as Gandhi would have it, but nevertheless, it shows you that even there, the logic of sacrifice cannot really be fully welded onto that of violence. You know, that even within the, the very heart of terrorism, yeah. uh, there were attempts to uh, recognize and therefore to split those two things. Uh, the virtue of sacrifice and the vice of violence. Right? And indeed, in the, uh, in the kind of heyday of this kind of terrorism, you saw very often these, these so-called martyrdom operations, which actually sometimes, and more than sometimes, killed only the perpetrator and never, and they were always seen as being badly planned or accidents, and maybe they were. But I think what's interesting about them is that they allowed for the terrorist sacrifice even to be split off from uh, murder. Uh, so even I think the terrorists, for them, it's actually quite difficult to pull the, well those things together. So you don't even have to look outside. Uh, outside, um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been anything, uh, I might be mistaken, I'm sure in people's everyday lives, there are efforts and attempts to uh, think about selflessness and duty and sacrifice in a nonviolent way. Uh, not least because Gandhi tells us that everyday lives are built out of these things anyway. Uh, and you see that here and there, and even more so in, in, in uh, societies marked by great violence. Uh, this, this is the irony that it's actually the nonviolence that keeps such stability is exists in those places. Um, and the problem is how do you prevent that stability and that nonviolence from simply becoming complicit in violence? Mm. 
but they're exercised by the state or exercised by terrorists or whoever. So, you know, I'm sure something along those lines is happening, but not as a movement. Mm -hmm. I think it's happening inevitably uh, in everyday social relations. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these become visible in literary uh, productions rather than through sociological analysis, yeah. which has not yet been conducted. So when you read novels or poetry or something, uh, you see that. Um, and you know, when I, on one or two occasions, I've written about so-called Taliban poetry uh, to show, you know, what's going on here? What does it mean for these people who are uh, defined as um, uh, entirely by their violence uh, to write poetry? And what kind of poetry do they write? What's going on in there? So, you know, how do you actually take this thing called violence to pieces? Um, and in doing so, uh, are able to analyze it and, as it were, reassemble it differently, reassemble some of its elements differently. Uh, and I think that is the only way in which you can rescue rather than simply exterminate. Uh, mm -hmm. Because extermination only perpetuates violence. That's and right. The, the task of nonviolence, and one reason why it has a negative grammatical form, is precisely to cut that chain of cause and effect, the karmic chain, as Gandhi would have it, that perpetuates violence. The whole point about the karmic chain of cause and effect is that your actions give rise to consequences, which gives rise to other actions and other consequences. And in order to achieve mukti, liberation from this chain of birth and rebirth, and of cause and effect, you have to somehow break that chain. How do you break that chain? Uh, mm -hmm. And how do you make sure that even your good actions do not end up perpetuating violence, the very violence you're trying to stop, right? Yeah. So of course it's a good thing, and in Gandhi's view necessary, if someone is trying to attack another, you have to stop them even if it is by force, even That's though right. force, force is violent. Uh, but how do you do that without simply, as I say, continuing that karmic chain of violence? Uh, so the negative character of nonviolence is about that. It's about disavowing yeah. the positive character of your own actions in a way. Right? So by withdrawal rather than by, if you will, invasion or conquest or anything like that. And yeah. this is why yeah. all acts of conquest and invasion even if they are called humanitarian, uh, as colonialism was once upon a time called humanitarian and humanitarian intervention uh, never succeed. And in our own time, we have known them not to succeed. Uh, so what we are staring at is a recent history, forget about the 19th century, of immense and unprecedented failure in which whether it is the invasion of Iraq after 9-11, or the invasion of Afghanistan before that, uh, or any number of other such military actions, they simply have not worked. Even when they have worked in uh, getting rid of uh, one regime and establishing another, the violence has continued. Uh, so the, the, uh, the unforeseen consequences of those actions, the karmic cycle continues. Uh, Faisal, can you go back a bit to the what you were saying about the poetry? Uh, what did you learn from that? And, and why is your book on terrorism called A Search uh, uh, in Search of Humanity? And, uh, yeah, is there yeah. a link? Yeah, it's called The Terrorist in Search of Humanity, partly because I was really interested in how the category of the human, of humanity and of the human species becomes a subject of political and even terrorist reflection. All right. So uh, one way in which terrorists uh, argue is by suggesting that they are acting in the name, in this case, and whether it is the Al-Qaeda or even ISIS, of a global Muslim community, which itself is seen as the human species in miniature. Uh, because it's spread across the surface of the earth and involves all different ethnicities, etc., genders, age groups, and all the rest. Um, 
so the, as it were, uh, or concept is the concept of the human race and of humanity. Uh, and what fascinated me is how both Al-Qaeda in this case and its enemies were deploying a similar language, that of humanity and humanitarianism, right? And perpetrating violence in its name. So I wanted to look at how this idea of the human race uh, came to proliferate in such debates because it's a relatively new idea, you know, in, in ancient and medieval and early modern times, when people spoke about humanity, they did not speak about it in empirical terms uh, because of course, no one knew how many people existed on the surface of the earth. There was no demography, right? Uh, they spoke about it in moral terms, you know, yeah. to be human meant often to possess the capacity of speech, for instance, or reason, yeah. right? Uh, whereas, especially during in the period of imperialism, when you have the cartographic and demographic mapping of the whole world, then you could literally count up the number of people who existed on the surface of the earth and say, this is the human race. It suddenly became demographic, right? And identities became demographic as well, abstract. They became majorities, they became minorities, either national or global, right? Or both. And the fights were how to have your numbers prevail as against the numbers of other groups. Uh, so this was the objective behind the so-called color line, you know, the number of white people on earth as opposed to the number of non-white people on earth. It was the issue behind the idea of the yellow peril in the United States, where you needed to keep out people from China because they would just outnumber everyone else and overrun the United States. So it resulted in different kinds of immigration restrictions, the same with Indians, the famous Kumagatamaru incident in Vancouver, you know, where Indian migrants are refused uh, uh, permission to disembark, uh, et cetera, right? So racism and demography are tied together. Uh, but the human race itself is seen demographically right, in a completely abstract way. Uh, so both the terrorists and their enemies tended to use these similar kinds of ideas and arguments, whereas Gandhi was very critical of the idea of humanity, uh, at least of one idea of it. You know, so already in Hind Swaraj, he's saying, this idea, after all, is the same idea that justifies imperialism, mm. because imperialism cannot be justified by the consent of its subjects. There's no democracy, they have not consented. It has to be justified by saying we have the interests of humanity at heart. We are intervening to protect, let's say in this case, Indian, Indian women, Indian children, you know, Indian Hindu widows, uh, Christian or Muslim minorities, etc. Right. Uh, so it is legitimized by very often and in large part by a recourse to a language of humanity and humanitarianism. Again, conceived of in demo, often in demographic terms. And Gandhi thinks this idea, which is a massive, big idea, is imperialistic in its essence, because it presumes the hubris, the pride that, you know, we can do this in the name of humanity. Uh, so it's an idea based on pride and hubris on the one hand, and on absolute power and technological power on the other, right? So, and so this comment of Gandhi's in Hind Swaraj comes from his chapter on railways, which he criticizes, of course, in, uh, in that book, because the railways give us the illusion of absolute power, that we can travel from one part of the country to another very quickly. Mm. And so we have this idea of mastery, right? But it's a utterly abstract idea because we, we can only grasp this space and all the people who live within it by literally traversing it really uh, quickly. We can never actually know anyone. Yes. So he compares rail travel with travel on a bullock cart, where you actually have to interact with people, you know, on yes. the way. Which went uh, to another extreme further with air travel. Exactly. So, you know, that logic has only been ramped up. So. So Gandhi is critical of this idea of humanity. And when he talks about it, 
he talks about it, if you will, in pre-modern terms as a set of ideals rather than as an empirical entity. But he's also very keen on um, defining it not as a closing in, but as an opening up. So, because one way in which we think about the human species is by contrasting it to the non-human. Mm. And the non-human is therefore left outside. Mm. Uh, and can, you know, so animal life can be treated violently uh, because it's not human and it's mm. distinguished from human life. Right? Gandhi also thinks that this way of defining humanity empirically in this sense, in this case, biologically, not simply in terms of number, is also identical to a racist uh, way of thinking. Just as the, uh, the problem of numbers, uh, you know, our numbers as opposed to their numbers, ah. fits so well with racism, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of uh, the biological definition of the human as defined by people who can have uh, um, relations of communication uh, and procreation or reproduction um, and commensality between them. Uh, this idea, Gandhi also thinks is a, simply a larger version of a racist idea because the racist ideal is also based on uh, defining a group by those who speak or communicate with each other, by those who live together, eat together, etc., and by those who only reproduce within that group. Right? So we can take that miniature version and expand it to the whole of the human race, but it still is the same logic. Uh, and Gandhi is much against this. So he's against both the numerical demographic logic, which is racist uh, by implication, and in the biological logic, which is racist in essence. And what does he do? He says, uh, what is truly humanitarian is to actually go beyond the species, your own species, to open it up. And for this, he uses uh, car protection uh, as an example. Now, car protection, of course, is interesting because it had been, uh, as it has become recently as well, uh, a flashpoint for violence. Uh, you know, the, the idea of cow slaughter and car protection. And what Gandhi wanted to do with this idea is to, is to allow us to think of it non-violently, oh. differently, which he thought was part of his essence. He said, what actually is car protection all about? Mm. Car protection basically is a way of thinking about relations between the human and the non-human mm. that are moral. And the, and the voiceless. The voiceless that are not based either on the demo demographic reasoning that defines one version of racialized human uh, uh, mm. humanity, nor on the biological version that defines an equally racialized idea of humanity. Because your relations with the cow and with all other non-human life are not based upon language or sharing uh, communication, are not based upon commensality or eating the same stuff, and are certainly not based upon uh, sexual relations and rep relations of reproduction. The very fact that you cannot speak to the animal is what makes your relationship with them purely moral. Uh, and in fact, it should be this relationship that serves as a model for human relations, not the reverse. Instead of anthropomorphizing animal life by saying they are just like humans, actually what you need to do is saying, no, the human animal relationship, it can be and should be fundamentally moral because it doesn't share anything. Yeah. It's not part of the realm of self-interest. And when we look at human relations, we must also realize that these things that we apparently share that define us actually uh, are unequally distributed. You know, when we say that, oh, you know, we can all speak the same language, but we know that only some people are heard. Only some people have the capacity to speak, right? So language is a sign of hierarchy, not of equality. Similarly with marriage and all the rest, right? So, uh, these ways of defining humanity by closing it up in a web of similarities and similitudes lend it to racist kinds of reasoning on the one hand and to other kinds of violence on the other because they are premised upon 
the externalization of the non-human. So mm. typical of Gandhi's way of thinking, he takes a fundamentally um, a modern category mm. in the way that I have defined humanity. Yeah. Absolutely crucial. Takes it apart and puts it back together again. So it looks quite different mm. and in a moral fashion. Uh, and he does so by using as examples or cases issues like car protection, yeah. which had become sites of violence. Uh, and he removes them from their violence to non-violence. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it's only one example of the way Gandhi operated. And I think what it shows you is how he was capable of operating at various level, levels simultaneously. So on the one hand, activist and political, because he's addressing not just a theoretical issue, a very real everyday issue. But at the same time, uh, he addressed it in a highly philosophical way mm. uh, and deeply moral way. You know? So yeah. those two things were not um, separated from one another. Mm. And I think that's what gives his ideas their power because they were never just purely theoretical, uh, nor were they purely pragmatic. Uh, but they relied upon their power, if you will. Uh, they relied upon their very everydayness for their power. Right? So for Gandhi, these were not just ideals that had to be somehow imposed on humanity. On the contrary, these are things that happen all the time and every day. Yeah. Uh, and car protection showed you that they happen, that in its ideal form, car protection should represent this kind of relationship, humanitarian relationship, humanitarianism as the moving beyond your own species. Mm. Um, and so it was, they were phenomenological in this sense mm. that Gandhi always linked his ideas to practices that already existed. That's right. Uh, they were not idealistic in that sense. No, no. And yet he was taking some very old practices and also taking them apart and putting them back together in very different ways. Uh, so in closing, uh, Faisal, what is your um, personal, I mean, you know, not just uh, not not as a scholar, but as somebody who's like the rest of us living through very difficult times? Um, what are some of the markers that you see for the possibility of nonviolence here and now? you know, in the world in which we are living. And, and in particularly for young people, what are some of the markers from this, this really amazing array of insights that you, you know, put forward? Uh, what are some of the things that young people can do in everyday life? Well, you know, I've just been, um, uh, as it turns out, I've just put the finishing touches onto an article on childhood, um, in which I also cite Gandhi, uh, though it's not about entirely about Gandhi, I'm talking about this, the quite recent emergence of children into public life mm. as activists, right? Mm -hmm. Greta Thunberg is only the globally the most important one. Yeah. There is Malala Yousafzai, there are many others, including yeah. many from India. Uh, and you know, I won't go through the argument of my article, but one of the things that struck me when I was writing it was that if children represent the future, uh, nonviolence, which all of them uh, advocate, uh, it really has a future as well. Uh, because they, more than anyone else, represent uh, the kind of thing that Gandhi was talking about. So true. I, I you know, uh, altruism and duty sacrifice versus self-interest, right? Uh, and they're literally trying to speak to us from their future, from their own future selves in a way, as adults. It's precisely because they are not adults or were not adults in the case of someone like Malala, who's now graduated from university, that they could stand outside the political sphere in some sense, because of course they weren't able to vote. They weren't able to drive. You know, they weren't able to give their consent to get married or to anything. Uh, they were not legal subjects in, even in that sense. And yet precisely because of this status as outsiders, they have had the most extraordinary um, resonance globally. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that they represent in some ways perfect Gandhian figures. Yeah. And so it's not accidental that for Gandhi, children were true moral subjects. Yeah. Uh, you know, and he says this in his, uh, one of his commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita, uh, that the thing about the child is that precisely because a child is not interested in the future, the child's acts are about the present. And precisely because the child is actually dependent on parents and on teachers and others, that they have the freedom to live in the present. And therefore, to, and morality must only be about the present. And this is the teaching of the Gita, right? You must have nishkam karma, right? You must have your, your actions are for the present, about virtue in the present. You're not meant to sacrifice the present for the future. Uh, which you never know will come anyway. You cannot actually predict it. Uh, so he seems to be arguing that the kind of figure, the child in this sense, who appears to be the most unfree of all, it's precisely there that we must look for freedom. It is from a subject such as this that freedom will necessarily come. Uh, so the child, of course, is a kind of archetypical example but he also looked for this freedom to, in his time, he thought African-Americans, for instance, uh, would be at the vanguard of nonviolence. And indeed, we have seen this happening in our own lifetime. Absolutely. Not only from the 1960s today, as we speak. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, these great protests that have swept the United States that have already made huge and un previously unthinkable changes possible. There's a lot more to be done, but something has happened. Um, and so when we open our eyes, we see this sort of thing happening everywhere. Uh, the problem is how to, as it were, amplify these kinds of acts. Um, and therefore, young people and children in particular uh, need not wait. Um, they are that future. Um, and it is to them that adults such as us must look. Absolutely. Thank you so much.